Good afternoon, good morning to, to folks on the, uh, the West Coast. Uh, this is Jacob Bardeen. I am with the event committee for CSA DC and just wanted to take you through just a, a real quick overview of the chapter and then I'll turn it over to our, our featured speaker, Josh, uh, for his presentation. Uh, just real briefly in terms of what we at CSA DC do, we're focused uh, a, a lot on working with uh, uh, with uh, users in heavily regulated industries, obviously federal federal government being federal government being kind of top of the list there. Um, we'd certainly encourage anyone who's not a member or who's not uh, who may be interested in to kind of to join in in with the, the chapter. Uh, we have opportunities with uh, working groups. Uh, we also sponsor monthly webinars, as you guys know, and um, we are looking to get meetups started uh, hopefully fairly soon. Um, uh, to uh, as, as things uh, loosen up here. Um, so with that, now let me um, turn it over to our featured speaker. Josh Stella is a co-founder and CEO of Fugue, a company that's transforming cloud security to help teams move faster and stay secure. Through Fugue's master classes, Josh educates cloud and security professionals about cloud configuration exploits and how to keep cloud infrastructure secure from attackers, often by demonstrating expl exploits in real time as a white hat hacker. Previously, Joss was a principal security architect at AWS, where he supported customers in the area of national security. Josh also served as a CTO for a technology startup and in numerous other IT leadership roles over the past 25 years. Uh, so with that, Josh, all yours. Jacob, thank you. Uh, Alyssa, thank you. And everyone who's here, thanks for attending. I think this is going to be a fun session. Um, what we're going to cover a bit today, I'm going to try this a couple of ways. Let's see if I go to my slides here. Are you seeing me big enough or should uh, uh, the, the presentation big enough or should I do a, sh a screen share? What do you think, Jacob? Yeah, that, that, that works, I think. Okay, great. That makes my life easier. So we're going to be talking about pen testing in the age of cloud. Um, cool. And I'm going to uh, be talking about this from my perspective as uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Fugue. Prior to that, as Jacob said, I was a principal SA at AWS. Um, and right now I'm the, the, the CEO and kind of the CTO of Fugue. So um, I'm going to be talking about pen testing from, from the perspective of uh, not necessarily a pen tester, although I will talk about that, but really as somebody who uses pen testing, who needs pen testing, understanding how this can and should work in the age of cloud, because the old techniques the in many of the old pen testers aren't up to uh, kind of current speed. So just a little, and, and this is going to be highly interactive. Um, we like to keep things uh, uh, very, you know, very interactive and fun. So there are a small number of slides that I'm going to go through. I don't like reading slides uh, when I'm on the, the receiving end. We're going to spend most of our time at a whiteboard, at a web browser, um, really talking in detail and, and mapping out uh, how these things work and talking about real cloud breaches that have occurred and what that means for pen testing, things like that. Um, we also like to have a little bit of fun. Uh, we, you know, it's been over a year since anyone's really done any in-person events and gotten any swag. So uh, a few times uh, through this, probably four or five times, I'm going to change my Zoom background to uh, uh, kind of like a geek culture Zoom background, by which I mean stuff that, that I like and you might also like. History of computing, science fiction movies, uh, video games, anime, stuff like that. And the first person to put in the chat to everyone what that video game is or the computer was called or, you know, the name of whatever I'm showing, name of the movie, uh, will win a few t-shirt. So uh, that way you might get some swag and we can have a little bit of fun and hopefully break the ice on getting the chat window active, which, as I mentioned, you know, interrupt anytime I'm doing anything with, 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 uh, uh, with, with questions in chat, you know, that's good if you interrupt me along the way. So just before I get, well, let's go do the agenda slide real quick. Uh, the way we're going to do this 
is I'm going to give you a, an overview of cloud misconfiguration risks and you know what you're really facing there. Uh, and then it says live demo. I'm actually not going to run live exploits in this one. I do that sometimes, but uh, uh, I'm not really. Uh, uh, this one today is a little broader. It's more about pen testing. And this says Q&A at the end, but Q&A all the way through is, is, is better. All right, how many slides? Do I, have? I have a total of seven slides and you've seen two of them. So not a lot of slide for today. I'm gonna throw up a background and the first person to know what the thing is. I'm gonna start with the history of computing and this is a DC group. So I'm gonna go a little bit back in the day but this was a uh, computer that, oh, wow. Uh, I am like a weird little floating head there. Um, this is a computer uh, that, uh, let's just uh, go there. Yeah, uh, that was uh, used in a fair amount of uh, federal applications. My background is very national security. Uh, so maybe that'll give you a clue who, who bought these things. Uh, they got used in quite a bit of movies um, because they're really cool looking. And all those little lights uh, actually reflected which processors were active. It's, it's not a Cray, Angel. That's a good, good guess. You're in the ballpark. Very expensive, highly parallelized computer. All right. Doesn't seem like anyone's getting it. So... Um, so we did have Matt Schultz type in Q&A ENIAC. Is that correct? It is not ENIAC. It and, is not and, ENIAC. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. I don't want to uh, uh, belabor it. It's a, a, a kind of a, a bit esoteric. Uh, it's called a thinking machine. And it was a massively parallel supercomputer uh, from the 80s and 90s. And I highly recommend if you're in the DC area, head over to the National Cryptologic Museum in Fort Meade, uh, just outside the campus of NSA, and you'll see one of those, and they have it running. And it's a really cool museum if you're into this kind of stuff, uh, computer security and so on. Okay, uh, let's keep going on some slides. So really what hackers are doing in the cloud is exploiting cloud misconfigurations. Um, yeah, yeah, you, you, uh, Aveth, you, 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 you came close, but we needed the name. We need thinking machines. Um, so uh, you, um, uh, your, the, your main attack surface, you know, what the hackers are focused on, is the misconfiguration of cloud resources. So every year, we at Fugue do a survey of hundreds of organizations operating at scale in the cloud, and. I think this is this is last year's survey. We just got done with this one, so we'll have some new facts soon that we'll be publishing. So watch the news for that. Our survey gets carried pretty far and wide. Um, for, so last year we asked a bunch of questions, and uh, eighty-four percent of respondents were concerned that they had been hacked and didn't know about it in the cloud. Uh, that is good. I'm 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 pleased that it's that high. It should be a hundred. It is actually quite difficult to know if you've been hacked in the cloud. Uh, and it is uh, fairly common for uh, people to find out only well after the fact through something like uh, the data being found on the dark web, or in the case of the Capital One breach, the hacker bragging about it on social media. It's pretty common to get hacked and not know about it for a long time. And I'll, I'll go a little bit into why. 92% uh, said they were concerned they're vulnerable to a cloud breach. That should also, all these should be 100, but that one really should be 100. If, if you're confident that no hacker can get in, um, you are helping them. You are helping them. They are clever. And I'm going to show you in detail how some of these hacks have happened. And you'll see the vectors are, are really new and unusual. And that's why your pen testing has to adjust and your pen testers have to know this stuff. All right, and then the third one, 76% uh, of respondents said that misconfiguration risk will uh, increase or stay the same. Okay, it is uh, 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 
absolutely going to increase. There's, it's not arguable. This is not an opinion. It's a fact. And the reason that misconfiguration risk is constantly going up is because cloud service providers are constantly adding features. And every time they add a feature, in theory, uh, that is something a hacker might learn to leverage and exploit. So the complexity of the landscape of misconfiguration breaches is constantly increasing. The other reason your attack surface is increasing is because probably if you're operating in the cloud, almost everyone is growing in terms of their cloud operations. And so every time you add resources to the cloud, you know, virtual machines or containers or managed databases or message queues, networks, any of that stuff, um, each one of those has potential for misconfiguration. So it's just growing all the time. So Dave Linthicum, maybe a year and a half ago, something like that at InfoWorld said, he's seeing a lot of cloud misconfigurations in the real world and it's scaring the hell out of him. Uh, I will say I have yet to see a single cloud breach hit the news that wasn't due to misconfiguration of cloud resources. It's, you know, I'm sure there's something out there that wasn't that, but all the big ones are, are due to this. They might involve some traditional uh, like operating system and network penetration techniques, but those are very minor pieces of this. Your, your traditional ideas about security in cloud, they're just not, not super relevant. Okay, uh, I also wanna talk here about, uh, what, this is part of why pen testing is so important in the cloud, is that the hacker strategy has really evolved. In the kind of pre-cloud days, you had to, generally speaking, you had to pick a target and find vulnerabilities. The reason is um, in the data center days, you know, each data center was a kind of a, an entity you had to try to hack into. There are exceptions to that, but that's often the case. So I'll use, uh, you know, the Sony motion pictures example. Sony made a movie that, um, the North Korean government did not appreciate. And so they breached, I mean, the, the executive email leaks are what made the news, but they breached everything in Sony motion pictures. It was a massive attack, but that's the kind of old version of, of hacking. And, and it still happens, but it's far less common than what I'm about to describe, which is the hackers now have automation and they're looking at all public IP address facing things constantly. So uh, instead of the hackers saying, well, I'm going to target, you know, Fugue, they're saying, I'm just going to run my automation and find anything that has vulnerabilities out there that I know how to exploit. I'm going to log all that into a database. And then I'm just going to go looking through the database, say, oh, look, you know, uh, company X has uh, a vulnerability. And even the really big prominent breaches, uh, Capital One, Imperva, Uber, maybe not Uber, but uh, Capital One, Imperva, those were both done this way. They, they didn't target those organizations. The hackers didn't. They just found through automation a vulnerability uh, and then picked a target out of there. And what does that mean? They already know how to get in, right? So you probably have, okay, so John Breeden here says skilled or well-funded hacker groups are employing automation to discover and exploit misconfigured cloud assets within hours of their deployment. That sounds scary, but I think it's actually really optimistic uh, from our research. Uh, and I, I can't give you an exact citation of a source for this, but I think it's much safer to think in terms of, you know, three to seven minutes. That when you put something out there, you know, a new S3 bucket, you spin up a virtual machine, anything, that has public uh, address, you know, public IP address, or you know, DNS record pointing to an address, anything like that, very, very quickly, it is going to get examined for misconfigurations. And by the way, these might not look much like your old school, you know, port scanning kinds of techniques, because these cloud misconfigurations are often API plane, not network. They often happen via the public cloud APIs. That's the typical attack surface, not your TCP IP network. So all your layers of TCP IP protection do nothing in most of these scenarios, uh, network-based, uh, you know, uh, and, and host-based. Most of those do nothing too. You have to be concerned with 
the configuration of these resources. All right. So why pen test your cloud? I hope it's becoming clear. Um, it, it, you know, before I get into this, I want to say, you know, people often ask me, I've, I've devoted a decade of my life to doing cloud security. And, 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 and by the way, I'm a software architect programmer as a background, not like a security analyst. I, I build large distributed systems. Fugue, for example, our product, uh, you know, has millions of cloud resources we're managing for, you know, dozens of customers, uh, you know, high sensitivity environments and so on to prevent all this stuff. And people ask me, um, you know, what's the number one think about, thing to, to think about in cloud security or to do in cloud security? And I always say, uh, read what the hackers are doing. That's what you care about, right? All this other stuff is a means to that end. If, if you can't keep up with the hackers, they will, uh, you know, beat you. They will win <laughs> and you will find out in the news. Okay, so why pen test? Because you want hackers that are experienced at doing this, uh, doing it for you instead of against you. Now, a lot of these cloud misconfigurations are not seen as compliance violations. So a uh, few, you know, we support dozens of these compliance families. NIST 800-53 is probably the one you're most familiar with, but SOC 2, PCI, HIPAA, GDPR, CIS, a whole bunch of them. We support all that stuff. And what we've learned is the hackers are way ahead of those compliance frameworks. They are employing attack methodologies that those compliance frameworks don't, don't imagine. And you know a lot of that is because one, they move pretty slow and uh, the, the compliance frameworks, the hackers are constantly evolving. And two, uh, most of those compliance frameworks kind of began life in the data center world where you know, just the attack <laughs> surface was primarily network and host-based. And so you still need to worry about that stuff, uh, but a lot of the cloud native attacks, those, those compliance frameworks just miss. So you need to use them, but you need to, to do more too. Um, a lot of these uh, hacks are, are things that are really not seen as vulnerabilities, and that makes them really easy to miss. Um, and they're often only apparent in the full context of an environment. So in other words, uh, well, for example, in one of the big bank uh, one of the big bank hacks, the uh, you know the press said it was all a a, a, a WAF. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, sorry, I got distracted with the Q and A. I thought maybe somebody had asked a question. Um, ask your go ahead and ask your questions in chat. We'll try to keep an eye on both. Um, but uh, in that breach, uh, the the press reported that it was just a. Uh, a WAF misconfiguration, that wasn't true. I mean, there was a minor issue with a WAF, but it was really an IAM, Identity and Access Management Role Assumption attack um, and an S3 API attack. So um, a lot of times, um, you know, these things are just only apparent in that context. You have to understand, the hacker will understand, can they flip an IAM role association to get to S3, for example? So you need to see them together. Um, all these things combined mean these, means these things are incredibly common in enterprise cloud environments. You know, one of my favorite uh, G2 reviews we've gotten, and it's a positive review, but it, it starts out with something like, Fugue is going to hurt your feelings. Uh, we're going to find stuff that you thought was okay. And, um, and that's good. You, you want that visibility. And that's what your pen testers are going to help you with, whether they're internal or external. They're going to help you learn uh, where you are vulnerable prior to your data being stolen and you ending up in the news. Okay, uh, Juanita asks, as a software architect, do you think that uh, security design, whoa, where to go? Okay, uh, do you think that security design should be built into the application stack, as you say, the network and host network security is not working? So yes, you need, you need both. And cloud architectures are, are really uh, quite different than data center architectures. Let me just show you. Just 
Josh, we lost your audio, I think. I'm sorry about losing the audio. Give me a second to fix that. We can I'll hear you sure. now, but when yeah, you Yeah, I know what I did wrong. Give, give me one <laughs> sec. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm running a kind of complicated setup here. And I'm... Okay, are you hearing me now? Yes, we are. Okay, good. Uh, that was user error, like 90% of errors in um, computing. All right, so I'm showing you a diagram here, uh, an architectural diagram that we, we generate these in Fugue so you can understand your architecture. And things like uh, whether this S3 bucket is accessible via uh, you know, um, uh, uh, principles that are, that are not coming through this VPC network endpoint. That's a very architectural decision. Like I would argue that you should probably usually have bucket policies on S3 buckets that require uh, specific endpoints if you're, uh, if you're using that style of architecture. So I'd say the vast majority of cloud architecture is really, uh, of, cloud, of cloud security is really architectural. So it's about the application design, but it's also about the infrastructure design. And that's the main attack surface. So it's a complex world. <laughs> I'll just, like I said, I've devoted a, a decade of my life to it and I learn every day. But yes, you, it has to be baked in, especially in the more cloud native architectures using containers and serverless functions and so on. Um, Okay, Angel commented, good point on the WAF, frustrating how hard it has gotten to find out what actually happened in an incident. Yes, uh, even from CISA, InfraGuard, ISACs, and other commercial forms. Yes, it is really hard. People don't want to usually talk about it. Um, if there is a DOJ filing, and, and uh, in, in, um, in some of these cases there are, uh, I'll, I'll look at those. Um, some folks, I'm going to show you a blog from a vendor who got hacked and boy, did they do the right thing in terms of uh, sharing information about how it happened. And it's one of the examples I'm going to use for, you know, how to do some of this, uh, pen testing and how to think about it. All right, cool. We're done with slides for now. Uh, I only have one more, which is just got our contact info on it. We're going to go into, uh, having some fun. All right, uh, but before we do that, I'm going to do a background. And let's try. We won't do history of computing. Let's try a science fiction movie. All right. Let's see. Uh, and if you put your responses in chat, that would be great. And there is also a question in Q&A, Josh. I don't know if you see it. Oh, let me go back. Uh, hey, Sylvia, just leave those open. OK. Uh, uh, thanks. All right, so this, is, this background is from a science fiction movie by an extremely famous director, um, uh, one that is much better known for some other very famous science fiction movies, maybe the most famous. Uh, but this is uh, a remake of his um, uh, uh, film school, you know, big, big project. All right. Uh, it's not Steven Spielberg. Uh, and, you know, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, not Steven Spielberg. Uh, director or movie will work. Okay. Eveth asks, do you think that agencies should be quarterly monitoring and checking their vulnerabilities as cloud and internet have been out for a while? Not sure why the USA is lagging behind. Thanks. Uh, Tom said Kubrick, not Kubrick, one you probably, probably bigger than Kubrick. All right, uh, to Eva's question, um, I believe that agencies should be checking their cloud configurations all day long, every day, in an automated way. Uh, not quarterly monitoring, but constantly monitoring. And that's actually why we exist as a company, is, is to do just that. The problem with, with quarterly or biann you know, annual or uh, things like that, not Cameron. It's more obvious, guys, the biggest science fiction director of all time. Uh, it's his student project. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the hackers are constantly moving fast. Remember we said it's minutes uh, when uh, between you putting resources out there and hackers discovering them and any uh, exploitations of them. So 
uh, it really needs to be done constantly. Um, and it's really easy to do that in the cloud. That was really hard to do in the data center days because you had to do like data calls and stuff. The beauty of the cloud from a security perspective is it's all APIs and therefore you can use automation to do all of this assessment. And, uh, and we do that all the time. All right, uh, Nilsa got it. So this is THX 1138, which was George Lucas's uh, student project uh, for film school. And it's, it's a really neat, uh, I think the original was in 1970 and it's, it's very like funky early seventies, really cool. Uh, and then it was remade in 2015 and it's, it's actually quite good. It's more kind of like uh, dystopian 1984-ish than Star Wars-ish. But uh, if you're into that kind of thing, it's a lot of fun. All right, let's uh, turn my background off. Okay, and we're going to now switch to, um, what should we do? Let's, let's go to the web browser real quick. And I'm gonna show you, I mentioned uh, a company that had just done an excellent job uh, when they got breached of sharing information. And, and I love it. I mean, this is just good citizenship uh, in computing, but it's rare. Most people are not good citizens. Uh, Uber, for example, just tried to hide the breaches that happened to them, but I think that's kind of on brand. Uh, but here we've got a company called Imperva. Imperva make cloud security products and they, they make good cloud security products. So, uh, you know, it's kind of, uh, when you read about a cloud breach in the news, a lot of people get very sort of disparaging of the organization. And I just think those poor, poor folks, because even the ones who are really good at it do get breached. Um, you know, you look at, uh, I don't wanna pick on Capital One, but Capital One is probably the most sophisticated uh, security uh, uh, user in the banking industry of cloud, and even they got breached, and they're awesome at this stuff. So Imperva, um, they got breached, a bunch of their customer data got stolen. Okay, so why I'm talking about this in the context of pen testing, so that you understand what your pen testers need to be doing, because it's not just port scanning, okay? That doesn't matter that much anymore. So here's what happened. Uh, uh, they said, what happened? The TLDR, our investigation identified an unauthorized use of an administrator API key in one of our production AWS accounts. All right, let's talk a little bit about. And we lost your audio again, Josh, when you went to whiteboard. All right, am I back? You are. All right, I need to save this template so I don't keep making the same dumb mistake. Okay, so um, I'm going to go a little bit into a whiteboarding session on uh, what are these API keys? Why do they figure uh, so frequently in these breaches in almost all of them? And, uh, and, and how, do, how, how to have a mental model of cloud security. Okay, so the first thing is to have this mental model, you have to understand what you're securing and what hackers are going to be posing as, right? So the basic security model in AWS is based on principles who are actors. If you, if you, if you ever did UML, so I'll put me here. Um, they're actors. They're things that it, people and programs, we'll put a process here too, that, um, can call actions. Actions are things like get object from resources. Okay, so that might be an S3 bucket. We'll call this one foo. That might be um, a Docker container. Let's draw a little, little whale. That's an ugly whale. Uh, we'll call that bar. And maybe it's a, um, I don't know, a uh, DynamoDB database or an RDS database. Okay, because the example, um, we'll just call this one DB. So when, when, you're, when you're thinking about these API keys and why people want them, the API keys 
are ways to get access to what are called allowances or permissions in the cloud. So in AWS, there is a default policy. So if, if Josh here tries to do a Git object from this S3, from the Foo S3 bucket, out of the box, AWS denies that twice. They deny it here and they deny it here. So what I have to do, if I want Josh to have access to Foo with Git object is I have to poke little holes right in these walls of denial. Um, and by the way, this is an excellent design on AWS's part. In order for this to work, I have to explicitly allow it. So what are the API keys that in Perva, they said admin API keys. That's API keys with, I mean, there are thousands of these actions in AWS. It's everything you can do in AWS. You know, make a new uh, firewall or make a new security group. Everything you can do in AWS are these actions. They're the API actions you can take, the verbs of the cloud. Well, obviously that's very attractive to hackers. You need those to exploit map cloud misconfigurations. So um, when you're uh, thinking about admin keys, boy, that is, that is really, really bad because that might be, you know, all. Now, I'm gonna argue right now, you should be very concerned with those, and these are typically expressed as IAM policies, identity and access management. That's what those API keys are for, right? To get access to an identity. And that identity has those allowances, has those permissions. So you really need to keep your keys limited in scope, keep your, your access, your allowances limited in scope, make them least permissive. And also um, you need to, um, uh, you need to be thinking about rotating those keys, right? Because if they are uh, not able uh, to be used for very long, then somebody going and finding a set, you know, unauthorized use of an admin API key, maybe that key was sitting around for a long time. If you're, if you are um, uh, rotating it regularly, when a hacker found it, maybe it wouldn't have been useful. Okay. All right. Um, so that's what they're going for. So the hacker found that, and there's a little history on how it happened. And this is, this is really intriguing to me. Uh, th this is the kind of stuff I get intrigued and excited about. And uh, I, I, hope, I hope you don't judge me too harshly on that. Uh, let's see, some key decisions made during, so they were moving a product into AWS um, and moved a database to RDS, Relational Database Service. Uh, RDS is awesome. Um, if done properly, highly secure. Okay, but they moved to AWS RDS. Some key decisions were made during the evaluation process uh, that taken together allowed information to be exfiltrated from a database snapshot. Okay, remember I said that a lot of times these, these attack surfaces, these misconfigurations are only available, are only, uh, uh, you know, understandable in context. And that's why these things taken together allowed it. Very often there's a chain of activity and you'll see that in this imperva breach. Okay, uh, another interesting point here, a database snapshot. This is a common hacking technique in the cloud. So what this is, is essentially not exploiting the database running itself, but exploiting the backups, the snapshots in the cloud, the backups are called snapshots. And in a data center, you're typically gonna have a proprietary or maybe open source backup solution, right? That, um, uh, that you're running. And it's gonna be different on a you know, data center by data center uh, basis. It's gonna be different on, uh, on each of those. And so hackers historically haven't spent a lot of focus that I'm aware of going after backups because then you've got to hack the backup system, right? Which is, and, and who knows if, if the backup's even loaded on it from a media perspective. But in the cloud, when you take a snapshot of a database, it's always going into S3 and the hackers know that. So they know where to go and they know that, you know, going back to our whiteboard here, 
uh, if they can get access to that get object command from S3, they can breach the data in your database. Okay. So, so this is a new way of thinking as a hacker, and it requires a new way of thinking as a pen tester. All right. So let's, and this again, I love that Imperva did this. It's just uh, such a good thing. By the way, their CEO did get fired within two weeks of this happening, but they still did the right thing. Uh, the CTO put this out. So one, we created a database snapshot for testing. Oh man, implied in this statement is that they're testing using a snapshot of production data. Please don't do that. Please have your pen testers looking for those. Because anyone, unlike the, the backup system in a, in, a, in a data center, where it really has to go through like a, uh, you know, to, to restore from a backup or to snapshot move something between, you know, prod and, you know, dev or test, typically requires some permissions to be granted. That's like a 30 second operation in the cloud for anyone with, with read permissions in production and write permissions in dev or stage. It's trivial. It's typing one command or clicking a button. So you need to be very attentive to this. And uh, it, it, is, um, it is a scary thing. Now I would recommend, by the way, that you assume that your dev and stage environments have production data in them because of that feature of cloud. I would assume that you cannot know that they don't. And that by the way, most cloud breaches don't happen to prod, they happen to dev or stage. And, and, and this is why, because most people don't secure those as much. Okay, uh, so they, they created a, a database snapshot out of prod for testing too. An internal compute instance that we created was accessible from the outside world and it contained an API key. All right, so, they created a compute instance, probably a virtual machine, you know, an EC2 instance, although this could just as easily be a container, and they gave it a public IP address. Um, that is a fairly common thing to have happen. Now, in Feud, we, we will throw an alarm when that happens and tell you that's a bad idea, but, um, and it's also very common that, especially in dev and test environments, that uh, resources get created and then kind of forgotten about. Actually, let me let me time check. Do I have a full hour today? I didn't I didn't ask beforehand. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I was I was suddenly concerned. Is this forty five minutes? In which case, I'm running out of time. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So uh, so orphaned infrastructure stuff that you've forgotten about. Uh, is really is is really dangerous too, and that's the kind of stuff that an experienced cloud pen tester is gonna is gonna know to do. Know to do. Um, looks like someone's not seeing any video. Are folks seeing my video? Yes, your video is coming across just fine. Okay. Yeah, and you know, I think that might be might be your side. All right. Um, yeah, so don't leave orphaned infrastructure out there. You almost certainly have it out there. There's another nuance in this, which is that that host contained an API key. That could mean a number of things, but in my uh, kind of uh, ungenerous and paranoid view of the world, because I'm a security guy, I assume what that means is that they had a long lived API key. And we know from earlier that it was an administrative API key, which is terrible, sitting on the disk. Do not put your a AWS API keys in source code. Do not put them on disks. That is what the hackers are going for. And your, your pen testers are gonna understand this. They're gonna be looking, pouring through S3 buckets, public ones or semi-private ones. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a second looking for these API keys and hoping they're still active. So this key management is just absolutely critical and key rotation is absolutely critical. All right, this compute instance was compromised and the API key was stolen. All right, so in the old days, hackers getting into your server servers was the scary thing. 
that's not the scary thing anymore. That's just a means to an end. I mean, who cares? You got into one server. We're talking about a cloud system, a big distributed system. All I'm doing, all the hacker did here was break into, find a way to break into the compute instance. Maybe if it was a forgotten virtual machine, it had a CVE on it. Remember the hackers are using automation to find vulnerabilities, including things like CVEs. Um, they got in there and what did they do? They didn't try to stay resident on that, on that server, they, uh, uh, the compute instance. They probably didn't even try to, to, to get root access because who cares? if you control a virtual machine in the cloud, what you want is that API, API key. So that's the only reason they're breaking into that. And that's probably the only part of this breach, of this entire breach. This is the only part where uh, the hacker even showed up on the network, even appeared on the network. And it's possible that they did this without appearing on the customer facing network. So again, all of that port scanning stuff, you know, you might find a vulnerability on a CVE and go over via TCP IP port. You might also uh, be able to access this via the APIs. So, but very, very little of your actual vulnerability is due to uh, network-based attacks. It's API-based attacks. And then four, the API key was used to access the snapshot. They didn't attack the database. They don't need to attack the database. They know where the snapshots are because they're in the same place in every AWS account. They're in S3, and a lot of API keys have permissions to do reads on S3. They don't need to log into the database at all. Um, they just steal the backup. Now, in many cases, they won't even take the whole backup. They'll just stand up a new database cluster in your account and suck the data out of there. Put somewhere you're not watching, right? Put a new database cluster out there. So I hope I hope you're getting just how different cloud hacks are than data center hacks. They're, they have very little in common. Um, cloud hacks are all about these relationships. They're not about, you know, if I get into this compute instance, uh, who cares unless I can get over here into S3 and, and, and read records out, okay? And that's all API key stuff. So you're, it, when you're talking to pen testers, whether they're internal or external, you want to be finding out, do they really understand that like this IAM instance profile, these are the, the API uh, permissions and allowances, you know, going back to our, our, uh, our whiteboard, you know, uh, we, we've got uh, an EC2 instance over here now, right? Um, and it's trying to do, you know, get object to S3. It's trying to read, remember, we've got a database snapshot in here. Um, so we've got a database snapshot in here. It's gonna want to borrow those, uh, those permissions from that API key to do that. Okay, uh, Juanita, uh, I'm not gonna try your last name. Uh, so uh, the question is, how did the hacker get into the EC2 instance in the first place to steal the API keys? We do not know. The short answer is we have to guess uh, because uh, the, only, the, the, the detail we got was, uh, where was it? Um, this compute instance was compromised. <laughs> so, so that's not super detailed. Uh, there's lots of ways that could happen. Um, uh, so, so in this case, her, uh, Juanita asked, they would have to do that first. Yes, in this case, that's what they did first. In other cases, these API keys are found in completely other environments. So for example, uh, in the Uber breaches, both of them, all three of them, I think, the API keys were stolen from GitHub repos, not from running compute instances. Okay, somebody had, had saved API key and then, and then hadn't rotated them out so that they were uh, hacked that way. So um, in this particular case, that compute instance had some kind of vulnerability, but don't think that if your compute instances are all patched and, and invulnerable, and of course none are, even patch ones, that you're safe, you're not. There are lots of places these API keys can come from. All right, uh, William asks, would going full CLI mitigate the vulnerabilities associated with API keys calls? No, uh, the CLI itself, the AWS CLI, for example, uh, itself is using 
uh, API keys uh, that you uh, you pass into it and have to be configured there. And very often those are long lived ones, which are kind of necessary in that particular case in many cases. So it's just, it, it, there's no silver bullet to this. It, it is a, a, a complex and difficult problem. I teach whole classes on this. Uh, it's kind of a little outside of the scope today, but uh, our YouTube channel and Sylvia can put a link up has uh, whole deep discussions on this stuff on a a API keys and how to how to deal with it. Um, all right, let's go to their corrective actions. This is this is this, they also have awesome corrective actions. Uh, so I really appreciate this post from them. Okay, so the steps they've taken since this incident. To improve their security inclu include, okay, number one doesn't mean anything, right? Applying tighter security access controls. Uh, great. Um, you know, who knows what that means? Sounds good. Doesn't, doesn't say much. To increase audit of snapshot access. Yes, please do this. Do this. Uh, what your pen testers are going to do is tell you uh, things you've missed, but there's a lot of stuff you should be doing up front to make sure that they, they fail. Right? And all hackers fail. And man, you really have to be concerned about snapshot access. And by snapshot access, all we're talking about is S3 Git object here. I mean, this is, this is a very, very common permission right here. And that's all you need to get at a snapshot. Uh, we have two classes on creating secure S3 buckets. Uh, the short answer is you can really tighten that up by using uh, bucket policies and uh, some other techniques that are, I mean, we're down to about 12 minutes here, so I can't show you all that today, but we've got a couple hours on that uh, on, our, on our website. All right, uh, decommissioning inactive compute instances. Please, please, please do this. It's very common for us to go into a prospect and they'll run Fugue and get this diagram out in like 10 minutes. And they'll say, hey, wait a minute, what's that thing? What's this network over here? And somebody will say, this, this actually did happen. Oh, an intern built that last year. We should get rid of that, right? That's one of the reasons we built a visualizer is so that you can notice what's out there because it's hard to keep track of. And you know, I can build a global network in five minutes on the cloud. And that would have taken you know, years or at least months uh, to do in the data center days where I was procuring equipment and so on. Um, all right, so getting rid of uh, stuff you're not using, super important. Rotating credentials and strengthening our credential management process. This gets back to those API keys and limiting their blast radius and limiting the time that they are uh, useful. Um, and that's key. Uh, five, putting all internal compute instances behind our VPN by default. Yeah, you know, okay. Uh, I think VPNs are a little dated, but yeah, you don't want your compute instances typically exposed directly to the internet. Uh, you want them going through layers of you know, gateways and things like that. And increasing the frequency of infrastructure scanning. So uh, who was it earlier? Uh, somebody asked about uh, you know, quarterly, uh, quarterly checks. I mean, I, I think, you know, at least daily, at the slowest daily, and probably more like, uh, you know, numerous times a day, you know, this environment I'm scanning for a bunch of compliance families. Uh, Fugue best practices is where we put stuff that um, are cloud native hacks, um, but you, you, need to, you need to be doing that all the time and they increase their frequency. The good news is a number of these things are really easy. This one can be done, you know, with Fugue or with us in a few minutes. Other products take longer, but you can you can do it with other products. Um, yeah, this this can be caught easily with a security product like Fugue. Uh, this can be caught with a security product like Fugue. Uh, both of these can too. The hard one here is this number four, uh, rotating credentials and strengthening the credential management process. That is uh, land war in Asia, and it always will be. Um, so um, uh, tough to do. Okay, I wanted to show you one other thing today, and I would point you to this. This is the kind of thing your pen testers are going to know. So gray hat warfare, um, because being a white hat is boring, because white is boring. 
So what this is, is a, uh, I'm not showing you anything illegal. Uh, you can go to grayhatwarfare.com. And what they do, and there are lots of services like this now for different cloud services. I mentioned the, uh, the, the hackers, um, the hackers uh, seeing stuff in uh, just a few minutes. Well, this is one way. I mean, they have an API at Grey Hat Warfare. This is a subscription service. I can go buy a subscription. So what this is doing is looking at all the object stores, things like you know uh, S3 buckets and uh, uh, blob stores in Azure, you know, and uh, uh, object stores in Google, and it's just looking to see um, what uh, uh, is available to to the internet. Uh, so Nilsa asks, are there AWS native products that can do a good security check? I mean, you're asking the founder of a company that does much deeper security checks than any of the AWS native tools. So I'm pretty biased. Uh, there are things in there that can, can kind of get you started. There's about uh, like audit manager. Yeah, audit manager is more about data organization than it is about actual security. It's more about like pulling info together for audits. Um, we do all that and more. I mean, th they do have tools. I think there, there's a reason we exist as a company and, and uh, we have a, a lot of, you know, prominent customers is that uh, we do it much better, but they do have, I think there's like 18 or 20 AWS security tools that you kind of have to put together, uh, but you can do stuff there. Uh, it usually requires a lot of work. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to search all of Gray Hat Warfare. They've, they've gone and cataloged as much of the internet as they could for unsecure object stores and i'm going to look for dot pem files all right does anyone know what a dot pem file is give folks one more minute okay uh, I'll, I'll i'll tell you a dot pem file are login credentials they're api keys effectively this is not stuff that should typically be hanging out and exposed on the internet. But look how many it found. So it found 21,426 results because I'm in the free tier. And if I were subscribed to Gray Hat Warfare, I would get 20, almost 23,000 more. So we're talking about nearly 50,000. What is that, like 48,000 plus? PEM files that are exposed out there. And I'm, I'm not going to like pick on anyone too much. Um, and some of these might be totally legitimate to have out there. You might need uh, uh, PEM files for public access to things. That, that's entirely possible. Uh, but uh, a number of these uh, probably are, um, probably are uh, uh, PEM files that contain credentials that really shouldn't be on the public internet Put another way, some of those might be those very, uh, those very uh, a uh, uh, API keys that were used in those very attacks that I was showing. Okay, so they can come from a lot of places. All right, uh, we're almost out of time. Let's go back over here, and I'll put up contact slide and and uh, open it up for any other uh, final questions or comments i'm i'm just josh at fugue.co f-u-g-u-e dot c-o um and uh i'm at josh stella on twitter although i'm not a big tweeter um and feel free to reach out to me and uh, i enjoy talking to folks about this if you can't tell i'm pretty passionate about it and i uh i really enjoy it so um any other questions for me before I turn it back over to Jacob. Okay, well, thanks a lot for your time. I had fun. I hope you learned something and I hope uh, it was fun for you as well. Uh, so um, Jacob, why don't I hand the, the reins back over to you? And I'll, I'll stop my video and we'll, we'll wrap it up. All right, well, thank you very much, Josh, for a real interesting presentation and uh, Sivia for the support and the, the help. Um, there, we will be posting or providing a, a recording that will be posted on the uh, CSA, um, CSA DC ch uh, YouTube channel. So look for that. Uh, I think it typically takes a couple of days, but I know some folks are asking for that. And again, Josh, thanks for the presentation and everybody have a good afternoon.
Thanks so much for having us, Jacob. Take care. Our pleasure.